Brent Wheat here for Wild Indiana Video, and today we're going to take an interesting walk with John Seifert, the DNR's Director of Forestry, and we're going to find out why everything you think you know about forest management is probably wrong. This is pretty average timber for us. I mean, you know, we get accused of, of cutting the best trees, but the reality is we're leaving the best trees and taking out the trees that mm, need to come either because stock is too high. We're going to keep most of the white oak here because that's sort of the species that we know is going to live the longest. And if it doesn't have any farm issues or uh, defect issues or mm. overstocked, it's we typically will manage to that white oak piece and then, then we'll have to say it's time to start over again and create an opening like this. It's all about sunlight, it really is. I mean, it is like growing a garden. Whether you like it or not, it's all about the sunlight. You get the sunlight, things are gonna grow. Because of our long history of management, we're not managing for the dollar, we're managing for the system. So to have a forest that looks like this, not just 10 acres, but literally thousands and thousands of acres, I think says a lot about our philosophy and what we try and do as far as long-term management is concerned. It's kind of interesting, the, 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 the box turtles really never left the site. When you, when you make a clear cut like this, what they do is they'd hunker down in a ravine or a low spot for the first couple of years. And then um, once the cover came up, they started moving about. So they never even left mm -hmm. the site, which was really interesting because we thought we, we'd kill them all, but mm -hmm. we didn't. We didn't kill a timber rattlesnake. We didn't kill uh, a box turtle due to harvesting, which wow. was sort of interesting. Yeah, that's, that's really great. We've been talking about forestry. What, what is the biggest problem that the Division of Forestry has when they're trying to manage timber? Probably the perception of what we do and why we do it. Um, there's a lot of science behind what we do, why we cut trees, why we try to manage forests and keep them healthy. So folks understand, what are the two main systems of, of managing forests? Uh, we employ two, two different types of systems. One's called a single tree selection where we go through the forest and select individual stems based on thinning process, based on quality issues, maybe insect and disease issues. Uh, that's uh, probably 90-95% of our harvesting and then uh, we'll get into a situation where we want to regenerate the new forest essentially from the ground up and they, we call that an opening or clear cutting. Uh, and that, that has its own uh, issues at times because the perception is that we've devastated the forest but actually what we've done is renewed it. So let's talk about the, the clear cutting. Obviously folks get upset when a beautiful stand of trees suddenly turns into a, an open field full of slash but there's a lot of benefits to that. Can you talk about that? Sure, uh, like I said when we, we decide to make an opening like that whether it's an acre or 10 acres or 20 acres we're typically doing that based on on a need to renew that forest for whatever reason, whether it was devastated by an insect problem or whether just trees are aging out. And so when we go in and do that, obviously the, the aesthetics changes dramatically, but we know that in the forest floor, there's literally thousands and thousands of seed just waiting to germinate and it's all about the sunlight. So when we renew that forest, we know in two or three growing seasons, there's a forest that's gonna have 10, maybe 15,000 new stems per acre there. So it's really not an issue on the science and the biology. It's really a perception of the public is, are we devastating the forest? And clearly we don't see it that way. And the reality is if you go back into the turn of the century on in Indiana, almost all these hillsides uh, were, were clear cut. I mean, people were trying to either convert it to another use or they were using all of the various species for domestic use. So these forests are dynamic and they renew themselves. So uh, we feel real good about what we do there. One of the problems that uh, uh, maybe we face with public perception is the fact that we've talked about the birder, birding groups, for example, don't uh, maybe understand that many of their favorite species if not nesting in these clear cuts needs them to feed. Can you talk about that? Sure, uh, you need to go back in history to a point in time when the landscape was under ice. So the glaciers sort of really sc scraped off all the vegetation and uh, set us back. And since then, mm -hmm. uh, Native Americans as well as European settlements really had a disturbance on this landscape. So this landscape's been disturbed over and over again. And 
the reason I'm going there is that by the disturbance we've created a habitat that's unique to certain species. So those species, as they evolved over the hundreds if not thousands of years, are dependent on certain types of habitat to feed, to raise their young, to find shelter. So what we do is create those disturbance factors by harvesting. So they can either happen naturally through a, a wind event such as a tornado or a straight line wind, or they can happen naturally, I mean artificially, by us making a harvest. You personally and the Division of Forestry uh, as a whole has been criticized pretty heavily sometimes as uh, you're simply shilling for the timber industry <laughs> and things like that. Uh, what's your reply to that? You know, we, uh, we've always been harvesting timber. And, and what's happened is, again, you go back to the early 30s when this forest was just really saplings and seedlings. And now this for, for you're, you jump forward 60, 70, 80 years and it's maturing and some of those trees are dying. We're capturing some of that mortality before it happens. And in the process, obviously, we, we generate some revenue. So when our foresters go in the field, they have no idea about revenue because they don't anticipate it. They're going in and doing what they think is best, given the science and their education that drives what we do. And then we let those timber sales happen. Some of those sales that we do, like in pine stands, they may only generate two or three cents per board foot. So if we were going to generate revenue, we wouldn't be messing in our time with pine stands. We'd be spending our time in, in white oak stands where we know there's lots of revenue. So we clearly, uh, revenue does not drive anything we do. Yes, it's a benefit to us. It's a byproduct of good forest management as well as wildlife management, but it's not our primary goal. We've talked about species in general. We've talked about songbirds. Uh, talk about uh, probably the two uh, large animals that uh, a large group of folks in Indiana chase, and that's the turkey and the, the white-tailed deer. And how, how are they affected by these, these clear cuts? Actually, uh, if you're a good hunter, especially on the, on the deer side, you know it's all about browse. I mean, if you don't have agricultural crops to eat, you're going to have to have something that's green and buddy in the understory. And as the stands age, you tend to lose a lot of the understory. By creating openings, bringing sunlight to the ground floor, you create a habitat, you create vegetation, the deer come. And wildlife biologists will always tell you it's about the edge, whether it's a soft edge, which is created by harvesting, which goes away, or a hard edge, agriculture versus forest. That's where the wildlife tend to, to feed. The bottom line is what folks think of as a beautiful mature forest is actually less uh, ecologically, biologically diverse than areas that have a range of ages of trees. I would say that's probably a fairly decent statement. Um, as the forests age, you tend to get less species diversity, whether it's in the trees as, as well as the wildlife. And yes, there is some wildlife species that are dependent on bigger trees, and many of that is driven by cavities. I mean, as trees age, they tend to rot, you get cavities, so you, you may have a shift in one species versus another, and that's the dynamics of what we do, is we always try and maintain that huge diversity of age classes, and even area. I mean, some areas need to be hundreds of acres, well, other species can do well in, in smaller areas. Something that you had mentioned earlier was talking about the endangered uh, bats in Indiana, which is uh, very important to a lot of folks. And you're actually finding that they're moving into these areas because, again, it's producing a lot of insect life. Correct. It's, again, I go back to the sunlight. When sunlight drives everything, whether it's forage for a bat or whether it's forage for deer, when we create that sunlight, we've just, by making those openings, we've allowed those particular insects to thrive because there's sunlight there, it's warm, then you have this multiplier effect where you've got other species up the chain that are going to feed on those. And the bats are a classic example. I mean, you know, you, the bats have to navigate and they use sonar to, to locate obstacles. And when they go into a forest that's really heavily dominated with lots of stems, it's usually not a good habitat for them. So they tend to like open areas and they tend to like to, as we're showing in our research, they tend to be a preference for these openings because again, they can forage in an area without having to run into something. So bottom line, contrary to what maybe some uh, uh, people might say, you're not in the business to chop down every tree in the forest. Now I always tell people, I mean, we've been doing this for over a hundred years and it's not really in our best interest to put any species in danger or not manage the forest sustainably. So when people come to tell us that we're in this to make money or to, to do something else, I mean, it, it's just counterintuitive to me. I mean, we are, we are long-term thinkers. We, you know, we think in decades. 
we don't think in the Lex quarterly statement. So uh, I really struggle with folks who think that. We really have a pretty diverse group that manages the forest. We have wildlife biologists, we have archeologists. Uh, we, we, we are really concerned about a whole host of environmental issues as well as obviously managing the trees. And as I said earlier, the trees are a, you know, a byproduct of, of forest management and when we sell them. Uh, but we're always thinking the next 20 or the next 100 year cycle. It's just, just it's what we do. Well, great. We appreciate you taking time to talk to us and putting up with the uh, incredible number of flies that are flying around. It's that time of year. But uh, again, thanks and uh, uh, for taking the time. Thank you.